Port Metro Vancouver has its own authority. Uh, they have quite a sophisticated operations center which monitors the movement of all ships in the harbor. In terms of moving sh uh, tankers specifically in and out of the West Ridge Terminal, we do pass through the Second Narrows. And my opening slide there was actually a ship lining up for the transit through uh, Second Narrows. Um, Second Narrows is 137 meters across at its narrowest point. An Aframax tanker is uh, normally around 42 and a half, 43 meters across itself. And under, under an international scale that most countries accept, um, 2.85 times the, the beam of a ship is accepted as, as a, a safe parameter. So if you do the maths, we have, a, we have an entrance there which is 121 meters, uh, sorry, the beam of the ship times 2.85 is about 121 meters, and we have an opening which is 137 meters. So we're comfortably within those parameters. In terms of who actually does the job, however, we have something, the pilotage is regulated by a Crown Corporation here on the coast of, uh, here on the west coast. It's called the Pacific Pilotage Authority. Crown Corporation mandate, mandated under the P Canadian Pilotage Act. There are four in the country. The Pacific Pilotage Authority is ours. So they oversee the actual uh, pilotage administration here on the west coast. The guys who actually do the job are very, very highly qualified marine pilots. And right now we have 101, 101 of them in the system. And uh, to become a senior pilot, you have to have between five and six years experience. Uh, and only then are you allowed to, to, to conduct ships over 200 meters in length. So um, when, you, when you're transiting second narrows, you will have two of those pilots on board. One will, t one will handle the communications, or one will handle the actual con of the vessel. But of course, they're interchangeable. Uh, in addition to that, what we've developed through a five-year process called the, uh, well, we call it an MP MPA, Movement Protection Area. What, what this is, is something that we've developed whereby we, we, we've looked at the whole process of pilotage, the level of tug escort that we apply, the time of the day that we'll move ships through second narrows, tankers specifically, and the weather and prevailing tidal conditions under which we'll make those movements as well. So we move tankers through at uh, daylight, high water, we will have a, an escort of three tugs made fast to the vessel. And we've simulated this uh, in, in many, many different ways to the extent that if you were to have a rudder failure or an engine failure and so on, the way that we actually tie those uh, tugs up to the tanker, if we have any of those failures, we can, can, we can still maintain that, tank, that tanker on track and, and we would not have an incident. And we, we've practiced this endlessly. The pilots then, uh, if it's an outbound tanker loaded, she'll be about 80% loaded because of draft restrictions at the first narrows. We cannot fully load an Aframax tanker. We can basically load uh, a Panamax tanker, which is a little bit smaller. The pilots will then take the uh, remain, the tug, to at least two of those tugs will remain tethered through the uh, passage of the harbor, through first narrows, and then the tugs will release and let the ship go on its way. Eventually, when she gets down to Boundary Pass, Harrow Strait, we will have another, tug, another tug escort engage uh, and actually take the ship until just, an, until just before she actually arrives at the pilot station off Brochu, which, uh, which is Victoria. The whole thing is monitored all the way by the Canadian Coast Guard, Marine Traffic Services. Nothing is left to chance. And when she's actually making the passage through the harbor, uh, all other traffic will, 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 will give her right of way. So there's no, uh, no, no potential uh, interchange between, between a, an outbound loaded tanker and some other vessel that might be moving in the harbor, uh, other than perhaps the sea bus, but they know better than to get in the way. If you are sincere and honest about our collective response to climate change, you will quickly recognize that oil production sources around the world are roughly equivalent, there is some variation, but consumption, efficiency, transitioning to other uses of energy is where we win it. And we're not gonna win it just here at home, we win it by working on it at a global level. It's going to take some time. The fact that Canada can gain revenue and wealth from trading in hydrocarbons actually can position us even better to tackle climate change. I, for example, sit on the board in Alberta, Climate Change Emissions Management Corporation, that's responsible for taking all of Alberta's carbon tax and putting all of it into 
technology change toward GHG reduction. We now have projects at play over a billion dollars worth of technology projects. Uh, that's over and above the two billion in CCS. Um, I think that we have to look creatively at how we're going to play in moving forward these issues. And don't forget that being an active trading partner in the main area of the planet that has population growth and economic growth in the six to seven percent range is going to be where the deployment of these technologies is most fundamentally impressive in gaining GHG reduction. So if we choose to, to not trade actively and pretend that somehow miraculously we're going to dodge the bullet, I think that's a silly solution. From real life example, we, when a contractor struck our pipe in Burnaby and spilled some uh, 1,400 barrels into the environment, uh, some of that made it this way through the sewer and uh, into Burrard Inlet. Uh, uh, five years later, we're seeing no residual effects of that. And I can't remember the exact number, but I think if we look back at the recovery rate that we had, it was, uh, it was the vast majority of uh, uh, 80 or 90 percent uh, recovery rate. So we've recently completed um, an, a very preliminary review of, of some of the incidents over the last decade, and there have been few in number, but um, our understanding is that, that a typical number is much closer to um, 90 or, or 95 percent, even in, um, in difficult areas, for example, uh, Plains had incident in Northeast BC, or Alberta, rather. It was a, a very large incident, but that was uh, a year and a half ago, and it's, uh, it's, their recovery stats are at over 95 percent. <laughs>